Good evening all, this is John Milburn for Laws 11062. This is Contract B. Thank you for joining us. We're up to week seven, but we're dealing with week six material tonight, which is discharge by performance or agreement. Now, if there are any questions as we proceed, please ask through the chat facility, or better still, just unmute your microphone and um, ask the question or make the comment. So I do hope that at this stage, Everyone is well advanced in the preparation for the second assessment. And don't be scared by this assessment. It is in many ways an opportunity for you to showcase some new skills that you may not have had an opportunity to consider in your studies um, at CQU to date. So advocacy is meant to be um, persuasive. So try to look at the issue from a positive and constructive perspective. Now, one thing I want to address is you may have noticed this thing called turn it in in the program as you um, uh, upload your written assessment work. Turn it in is a program that's used by Central Queensland University and indeed many universities and other institutions as a way of guarding against plagiarism. Now, don't be scared by that and certainly don't be concerned unduly if you find that you have a high Turnitin score or percentage when you lodge your work. That of itself does not mean in any way that you've done anything wrong. Can I just ask as a general thing, and just as to get you started with the chat facility, has anyone noticed this Turnitin? Has anyone had any questions or problems with it? Please let us know. Have you noticed, firstly, have you noticed Turnitin? Use it all the time, says Chris. Craig, yes, very good. All right, those of you that are using it regularly, no problems, so long as you reference Stephen, you've got exactly what I was about to say. Just the percentage will jump higher sometimes after submitted. I've heard that comment before, um, Jessica. I don't understand what that means, but um, don't be too concerned. The main rule, as Stephen has correctly identified, is it's there to ensure that you are appropriately referencing your material. And Bridget says, usually it highlights all the references and direct quotes. All right, good. Well, hopefully then it's a positive learning tool, um, learning in the sense of ensuring that you're complying with your professional obligations and um, re referencing your material well. Now, when I view assessment work uploaded through Moodle, it goes through Turnitin. I can see the percentage score, I can go into the program, see colour-coded material. Red suggests the possibility of plagiarism, probably isn't plagiarism. Um, for example, in a short written assessment, when a student cuts and pastes an entire piece of, let's say, legislation, albeit properly acknowledged and referenced, that's not plagiarism, but it may have a very high percentage score. Now, plagiarism is not something that turned in tests. It's not a program to directly test um, plagiarism. It just identifies similarity. So properly referenced, there's no plagiarism issues. Of course, it may not be your best writing if you're um, including vast bulk of material that is sourced elsewhere. So if you see a high percentage score, even though it may not be um, contrary to policy, it may encourage you to consider rewriting your piece, but that's only an issue that you might want to consider. So turn it in is not something to be scared. As many of you appear to be doing, it's something that you should embrace. And it's a mechanism to highlight the possibility of intentional plagiarism. It might also come across some unintentional plagiarism or improper or lack of citation or just coincidence. So we take all of those things into account and rest assured that at CQU, whilst we are vigilant in terms of monitoring plagiarism, it's not something that we want to, um, we're not out there like detectives trying to find it at every opportunity. I hope that makes some sense. Anyone have any questions about referencing their material, turn it in, plagiarism or ethical requir requirements generally? All good? All right, well, we'll continue. The next thing I want to raise is this is to do with contributing. And as you know, I'm very keen on ensuring that parties 
um, participants, if you like, uh, involved in collaboration, not collusion. So in terms of contributing, ask yourself, have you been asking questions in Q&A? Have you been answering the weekly problems? Have you been commenting on the contributions of your colleagues in the weekly problems? I suspect that many of you are saying, well, I really can do better than I am doing. Many of you might then be saying, well, the weekly problems, for example, and indeed Q&A questions, they're not non-accessible, so why should I bother? Now, the weekly problems, I would suggest, are particularly important. And even though they are non-accessible directly, they do help to focus your attention on important issues. That's the idea of the weekly problems. And it provides you with an opportunity to answer legal problems based on extensive legislation or case law on the material that you're considering generally. And it allows you an opportunity to convert that which is bland reading of material into problem solving. And that's what the key question in the final assessment will be all about. In other words, answering the weekly problems challenges you to identify the relevant law, to apply it in a practical sense, to come up with an answer and a final solution to a problem. Also, if you're helping with collaboration and you, if you like the way that one of your colleagues answers a question, you can learn from that. Um, and who knows, maybe if you're contributing material, your colleagues will end up referencing your work in answers that they provide. And done carefully and selectively, that may be appropriate. But that's not an invitation for you to simply copy somebody else's work without considering it. I do hope that makes some sense. Again, any questions on weekly problems, problem solving generally, contributing to the material that you're learning, collaboration, all good? All right. I'll just check on the chat facility. No, nothing there. Well, let's get on to the substantive part of tonight's content. Discharge of a contract by performance or agreement. Sounds pretty straightforward, really. But there are a number of ways that a contract can come to an end. And we talk about termination of a contract by performance or by agreement. So when a party has performed its obligations under a contract, or more particularly when the parties have done so, the contract comes to an end in terms of the obligations within it. But can I ask a question? Does that mean then that no one has any rights in relation to the contract? The contract is performed, both parties have performed the contract. Does that mean there can be no litigation involved in that performed contract? Any thoughts? Even if it's a yes or no in the chat facility. Depends. Thank you, Bridget. Any other contributions? All right. Let's explore the issue. No, says Sharon. Yep. What if I ask you this question? Assume for a moment that a contract has been performed by both parties, but it has not been performed well by one of the parties. Let's assume it was a contract, for example, for the provision of services or a construction contract. Do rights and obligations come to an end? I think the answer is no. So, and the parties may agree that a contract comes to an end, but generally that can be on conditions or it may be unconditional. So there are different degrees to which we can say that a contract comes to an end. And all of this really comes back to this question of what's involved in performance of a contract and what's involved in proper performance of a contract. So the time under which a contract is to be performed goes to the performance obligations. In other words, if someone is required to complete a contract 
within a certain time and they fail to do so and run over time, even though they're ultimately able to say, I performed the contract, do you think that the failure to comply with the temporal obligation means that the victim, if you like, the innocent party, may have some right of redress? Will depend on damages sought. If part performance has been completed, then you can't take the option, says Stephen. Any other thoughts? Now, those of you that may have some involvement in building contracts might be aware that it's typical to build in a time schedule or commitment, and there is the possibility of liquidated damages to run in relation to any amount of time that runs over time. <clears throat> so the time associated with performance of a contract, I would suggest, is something that is important and potentially is actionable if a, fa a party fails to comply with their legal obligations on time. Now, later we'll talk about real estate contracts and that where it that's an area where it can be critically important to fulfill obligations about performance of a contract on time. There's a particular phrase that we see often when it comes to the obligation to perform real estate based contracts on time. Does anyone know what that little phrase is that I've got in mind? Try and be a mind reader and think about what I'm, I'm, I have in mind. Any thoughts? No. The phrase that I'm considering is time is of the essence or time of the essence. Has anyone seen that in a contract? The obligations performed um, contained in this contract as to time shall be of the essence or words to that effect. It's critically important in real estate conveyancing contracts and it's the source of much litigation, stress for conveyances and, and potential angst. If there's no obligation directly in, expressed in a contract for time, is the contract void for uncertainty? Any thoughts? Or will a, contract, will a court read into that contract some implied conditions or terms? Generally speaking, if there's a failure to include a specific term regarding the time performance, courts will imply a term, and that is that performance is to be completed within a reasonable time, whatever that might be. So that depends very much on the nature of the obligation and in some ways, the rest of the terms of the contract. So the time obligation can be expressed by reference to a certain date, which we often see in say conveyancing contracts, or it might be based on a certain period, or, or it might be on a specified event or a combination. For example, it might be settlement of a contract is to occur 14 days after the buyer confirms that finance is approved unconditionally. So that there's some way of determining the exact date by reference to an earlier event. So um, all of these things, particularly the issues around when a court is likely to imply a term into a contract such as performance within a reasonable time, is referenced by way of considering the facts and the court makes a determination as a question of fact. Now that leads to another general question. When you're dealing with these sorts of disputes that are before the courts, do the courts make findings of fact uh, or do the courts make findings of law or do the courts sometimes do both? Any thoughts? We're getting some votes here. Sharon says both. Any other thoughts? Fact, law or both? <clears throat> 
I'd I'm going to go. Both. Yes, this Christopher. I'd say both. Both. Yep. I agree. Generally speaking, both. Are there any exceptions that sort of come to mind? Not based on contract law, criminal law, jury trials. That's where we see a clear division between the arbiter of fact, which is the jury, and the arbiter of legal matters, which is the judge. So generally speaking, the question of what is a reasonable time is a question of fact. It's determined when performance is due rather than by reference to the date the contract was signed. It depends on the facts and it's determined by a court in an objective type manner. Now, as you read through the notes, you would have seen there are some key terms. Condition precedent, condition subsequent, part performance, and we've already had someone refer to part performance, severable, severability, and substantial performance. Because we've been a bit quiet tonight, again, I'll just ask this very simple question. Of those key terms that I've mentioned, yes or no or not sure, do you think you understand the, the legal implications of those terms? Do we understand what we mean by condition precedent, condition subsequent, part performance, severability, and substantial performance? Don't worry, I won't read out names, but just yes or no, or not sure or something. Not sure? Any others? You are quiet collectively tonight, aren't you? Getting there, yeah, not sure, not sure. Okay, well, here's the challenge. <laughs> Night shift went through the readings for this week. Here's the challenge for you. Um, I'm going to ask that you be as clear as you possibly can be in relation to these terms. And the terms are set out in the study guides. So you've got a basic definition there, but I think it's important you go beyond that and start to identify relevant legislation, if there is some relevant legislation or some case law and maybe some quotes from judges, for example, part of the primary sources of law or from textbook writers and authors, some of the secondary sources of law, if you can. Now we've already discussed severability, for example, haven't we? Can anyone recall the area of law where we discussed at some length, the issue of severability. And I said some length, we, we dealt with it in passing really, but we dealt with the topic generally in, in some length. Can anyone think of an example of where something might be regarded as a severable condition in a contract? Restraint of trade was an area, wasn't it? where it may be, for example, that a court says that particular restraint of trade is unreasonable, but we will strike it out of the contract, we'll strike through it, but the rest can remain. So when we talk about something that's severable, we're really suggesting that part of the obligations may be removed or dealt with separately without preventing the rest of the contract from operating. And when we say that it might be removed, Again, the problem with that definition is it's worded in the passive voice, not the active voice. What we really should say is that the court may remove part of the contract or the obligations contained within it um, without preventing the rest of the contract from operating. So that's what we mean by something that is severable. Condition precedent means something has to occur for the contractual obligations to take effect. Condition subsequents look like condition precedents sometimes, but it works from the opposite spectrum, saying that a contract will terminate, um, sorry, a condition will terminate the contract in the event that it, it occurs in that instance. So condition precedents and condition subsequent sometimes look the same. So I'm going to ask you to, to challenge yourself to find, as I say, some examples of both, because this is not necessarily an exam hit. 
But this is the sort of thing that examiners like to toss into a, a problem. And the, the way in which you answer the question will mean there's a fork in the road. And if you determine that a contract condition is precedent, you go one way and you come to an entirely different conclusion to that which you would if you determine that the condition is a condition subsequent, different remedies, different law, different approach altogether. If you fail to recognise that it's potentially either, that's where you're probably not going to pass the question. In other words, you may have a perfectly good argument one way or the other. It doesn't mean that because it's different to one I come up with, that it's necessarily wrong. A theme that I've suggested throughout the um, unit so far. So hopefully you're up to the challenge of providing some clarity for yourself in terms of what we mean by these terms, what are some, some of the examples, and have a good idea of how they're used in practice. John, can I just ask you yes, a question? Yes, on Christopher. That? Um, one of the one of the things that I've just come up recently uh, in some stuff I was doing was termination for convenience, which was a term for a construction contract. Would you consider that a condition subsequent? Because it actually is where they can actually walk away and cancel the contract at that point. I'm not familiar with the term. I'm sorry, Christopher. Okay. Termination for convenience. Convenience, yeah. It's used in construction a oh, lot. Okay. They I haven't said it. They sorry. They give 30 days notice and say, we're cancelling the contract at this point. The case law that I've looked up so far says that they still have to pay, like the, the client has to pay to that point and the construction company just works or walks away. Um, so I just wondered if that was an example of condition subsequent. Yeah, look, I, it probably is. Um, um, and that's that's certainly the, the effect of a condition subsequent. It's a, a condition that if activated terminates the contract if it if it occurs um, but it's usually an external event rather than necessarily a party taking advantage of a particular contract but I agree with you it's certainly not a condition precedent and I think there's a good argument to say it's a condition subsequent so that's that's a good one cool. it, Thank you. and it sounds like Stephen says sounds like part performance or portion and we'll talk about some of those things as well there was the important case of the Commonwealth against Amman. I'm not sure if that's the pronunciation, but that's a good case aligned to that type of thinking. All right, so thank you for that, Christopher and Stephen. Termination by performance. One party may consider the contract is performed. The other may disagree. Now, here's we get into an interesting area of law. One says, I've performed the contract. The other says, you haven't, you've breached the contract. The first party says, well, by you saying that I've breached the contract, you've breached the contract. And we get into this sort of circular argument of finger pointing, but it does have some very real legal effect. And sometimes you need to make a call and you're bound by that call. Um, Kumpatu is a very important case in that area. If you haven't seen it, have a look at the Kumpatu case, you'll come across it regularly. Now I mentioned conveyancing contracts before and the concept of time of the essence. What's important here is that we can identify some of the methodology that people use in a practical sense when it comes to arguing that they have performed or if it's possible to, impossible to perform because of the others, other side, um, they've, uh, they're ready to perform. So quite often an argument will be based around performance on the basis that a party is ready, willing and able to perform the terms of the contract. And it used to be the case that when we have um, settlements uh, in practice, one party would, um, you know, the settlement would be at a certain location, certain certain time, and you'd hear sort of broadcast um, I'm here for the settlement of Anderson and, you know, Brown, um, you know, calling Brown once, calling Brown twice, calling Brown three times, then make a note. And that was an attempt for the first party, Anderson, to say 
I was ready, willing and able, and I called for and was ready to tender at settlement, but the other party didn't turn up. So sort of an evidentiary thing. Now there is the issue of cooperation in performance because <clears throat> where the ability of one party, let's say the plaintiff, to perform depends on the cooperation of the other, the defendant, there's generally a duty to um, cooperate to ensure that the express terms of the contract can be fulfilled. And the important case there is Strati, S-T-R-A-T-I, against J-A-G Investments. Um, it's 1981 BPR 960. Now, I say it's important, but really what um, I can say is this, that particular case, which is potentially a bit obscure actually, was cited in the case of Mark Arneson, A-R-N-E-S-E-N, against Springs Beach Development, and that's 2008 QSC 283. Now, in that case, a contract was subject to a condition of council approval for the plan of subdivision, and the court implied that the parties would take reasonable steps to procure fulfilment of the condition and refrain from taking steps to prevent fulfilment. So tonight, in the context of performance, we've now got two instances where I've said that courts are prepared to intervene and imply or impose conditions that don't strictly exist in the contract because of the circumstances. And one of those is the implied obligation to cooperate in the performance of the contract. Now, the doctrinal basis for that is estoppel. And in the same way as Walton Stores and Ma identified that statements that were made then become binding, as it were, on the other side. In this instance, if a party commits to a contract and then doesn't cooperate or actively tries to thwart the contract, that is basically an estoppel situation that they're going back on what they had contracted to do, which was um, perform the contract in good faith. I hope that makes sense. So when you're dealing with contract issues and arguments about breach, sometimes you need to bring in some of these equitable principles such as estoppel. Now, doctrine of exact performance is, if you like, for want of a better term, a kind of old fashioned principle. It kind of relates to black letter law and the common law without the involvement of principles of equity. You've probably seen the case of Cutter and Powell. I think it's the oldest case that I refer to in any of the lectures of, over any of the subjects that I do at CQU. This one is 1795, it's 101 ER 573. Don't try and find the original case. The pr general principles are all we need. In Cutter and Sailor, uh, sorry, in Cutter and Powell, it was all about a sailor. Cutter was a sailor. And the contract was this. If Cutter completes the journey, he'll get paid. If he doesn't, then he won't get paid. Um, that was basically the contract. Now, what happened is Cutter died during voyage. His estate sought payment of part of the earnings and the court found very strictly that the obligation to pay Cutter was dependent upon him completing the entire journey. He didn't, therefore the estate received no payment for the work that he had done. There are a range of exceptions that moderate the harshness in that rule, but the preliminary question that you need to ask yourself when dealing with a problem like this is, are we dealing with an entire contract or not? An entire contract is essentially, please complete the entire task, otherwise what you're doing is no good to me. Can anyone think of any real life modern day examples of where we may realistically be able to argue the existence of a, an entire contract? Has anything come to mind? Any thoughts? <laughs> 
building a home, says Bridget. Makes sense, doesn't it? Unless the home is completed, why should you pay for something that's only half built? Property, yes. Um, you can't pay for half the property and get half the property. You need the entire contract. If you're a film director and you hire a movie star to complete the task of fulfilling a movie and they get halfway through and say, well, I don't really feel like doing the rest of it, you can't very well bring in uh, another actor to take over that role at the halfway mark, can you? It's kind of all or nothing. So when it's that all or nothing and it's really, there's no, no other alternative, then we're looking at an entire contract. So they do exist, but moderated by the exceptions and one of those is the doctrine of part performance. So the fact that the contract provides for a lump sum payment, even though that's significant in determining whether it's an entire contract or not, it's not conclusive. And a contract will not be an entire contract unless the parties have essentially agreed that the sum is payable only in the event of complete performance. So the doctrine doesn't depend on the existence of a breach of contract. Recovery may be possible even if the plaintiff has a good excuse for the failure of the condition precedent, Cutter and Powell. Real estate example, someone commits to buy a home. Halfway through the conveyancing process, they lose their job. They've already advised the seller that finance is approved. They don't complete the settlement. They ask for their 10% deposit, let's say $50,000 back. And the seller says, no, I'm keeping the money and I'm suing you for damages. Is that an entire contract? Is the buyer going to lose that money because it wasn't their fault that they lost the job? Any thoughts? I'm asking some tough ones tonight. Yes, it is usually conditional upon gaining finance, but in this scenario, the buyer's already committed and told the seller that it is uh, finance has been approved. They would lose the deposit and suffer damages. Yeah, I think the general rule is it, they would. Seems harsh, but that's just the reality. So conveyancing can be pretty tough. All right, any questions about anything that further that we've discussed so far? Now, coming back to Cutter and Powell, Seems pretty harsh, but I've given you a few examples of where in a modern context, there may be an entire contract and in a modern context, failure to fulfill all of the obligations um, may result in a breach um, of that contract. But ask yourself whether Cutter and Powell, for example, the sailor who died is a fair decision. Do you think it was fair? Maybe not. But in other circumstances that we've identified tonight, people have mentioned building contracts, for example. You know, if you sign a building contract, the builder digs some holes, delivers some material, generally creates a mess, and then says, look, I'm sorry, I've got a better job to do. Pay me for what I've done, plus my builder's margin on the materials that I've provided, and you can go and get someone else to take over. Is that fair? Maybe not. Sumter and Hedges, from 1898 is a case that deals with that issue. And it's still basically good law. We'll talk about that soon. Now, when we talk about entire contracts, what's the alternative to a, an entire contract? Anyone come up with some terms? If it's not entire, what is it potentially? Any thoughts? Substantial performance? Yes, not what I'm looking for, but a good good effort, Craig. Severable, that's the one I'm looking for. Severable or divisible. So we come back to one of those key terms. 
if a contract is not entire, then it might be divisible in parts, or it may be that certain parts of the obligations can be severed. It's a severable contract. So an entire contract is not severable merely because it provides for payment of the contract price over time. A building contract is not severable merely because it allows for recovery of progress payments. It's still regarded generally as an entire contract, even though the payments are staggered. But most contracts that relate to the provision of services um, or involve services generally performed over time will be regarded as severable or divisible. And a court may find, despite Cutter and Powell, that it is reasonable to pay the breaching party for the work they've done. The contract is said to be severed or divided into that which has been performed and that which has not, and the party is paid for what they have performed. Now, an example of this is Steele and Tardiani. It's a High Court case, it's from 1946. That's significant in the context of the facts. And in that case, an Italian um, intern was interned as slave labour during the war. And they were contracted, essentially slave labour. They were contracted to split wood into lengths of six feet, diameters of six inches, paid then on a price per tonne. The wood was cut, steel did the work, but not exactly. Um, the court found that the contract was infinitely divisible. In other words, it was a contract for payment per tonne of wood, not for a single payment for the entire job. Therefore, the internees were paid for the wood that they were cut into proper lengths. So this is what happened during the war, the internment of those that were regarded as um, uh, potentially aligned with the uh, Axis forces. An example in legislation now about apportionment and severability is section 232 of the Property Law Act, which deals with the issue of rents, saying that they are portionable in respect of time. So have a look at that. Now, part performance means that a party may accept may accept something less than full performance. If they do, they then can't claim the contract has been breached. And this is where you've got to be careful about the way in which you act and what you say, uh, what you write. Because an argument might be that even though there has not been full performance, there has been valid part performance, which has been accepted by you, and you're now not able to claim uh, that I've breached the contract. I mentioned Sumter and Hedges. The reference is 1898, 1 QB, Queen's Bench, 673. Sumter contracted to build some stables for Hedges. Sumter ran out of money, couldn't complete the job, abandoned the contract and left behind building materials. Now Hedges, actually used those building materials, completed the job himself. The question for the court was, did Hedges, as a result of doing that, accept partial performance of the contract? And the court said, no, he hadn't, because Hedges had no real option in the situation. He can't have a half-built stable. He couldn't get Sumter to complete the work. Removing that which was there and starting again was not realistic or feasible. Therefore, Hodges had not, and this is the key word, had not voluntarily accepted the part performance and Sumter was paid for the materials, but not his labor as the compromise. Now, substantial performance is where a party has completed all of the conditions, but has fallen short in relation to a warranty rather than a condition. Now, we did this in contract A, didn't we? Warranties, conditions, we did that? Okay. So courts are reluctant to allow minor failures in performance as the basis for refusal to pay the contract price. So particularly if there's a breach of warranty 
that does not deny the innocent party the full benefit of the contract, it merely entitles them to damages. And an example of this is Honig and Isaacs, that's H-O-E-N-I-G against Isaacs. It's 1952 to All England, All E-R, 176. Honig was an interior decorator, contracted to furnish and decorate a flat. The price was 750 pounds, a lot of money then. Honig had been paid 400 pounds in part payment and Isaacs found fault with two items, a problem with a wardrobe and a bookcase. The, the evidence was that could have been fixed for about 50 pounds, but Isaac said, these are defects. I'm not gonna pay you anything of the outstanding 350 pounds, but the court held that being substantial performance and Isaacs was only entitled to retain 50 pounds, not the further 300 pounds. Lunar Park and Tramways Advertising is another good case. You'll see this in a few areas of law. We teach this in different subjects, so it's important. It's 1938-61 CLR 286. An advertising contract required contractors to display advertisements for about eight hours, and that was interpreted as requiring display substantially for eight hours. So that strict obligation for direct performance was not upheld in that case. So courts usually don't accept arguments that, com that commercial obligations in commodity contracts are discharged by such performance. But an example of where they uh, did not is Arcos and Ronison, um, 1933 AC 470. In this case, of Arcos, there was an obligation to deliver staves. Now staves are vertical wooden posts or planks in a building or other structure. They're about half an inch in thickness and it was not discharged by delivering staves substantially um, half an inch in thickness. So it's gotta be, um, there's gotta be a basic performance there. Now another issue I mentioned earlier is obstruction. If one party prevents the other performing, then, you know, for example, refusing to accept delivery of the goods or failing to take some necessary step, there may be an issue. In Planch and Colburn, 1831, Planch was an author of a journal series, started working on an article as contracted to do, went to some expense. The publishers ceased the publication, refused to accept the article, but the court found the author was entitled to payment and his efforts were rewarded on a quantum merit basis. Have you come across that term, quantum merit? Do you know what that means? It's pretty important. You'll see it regularly. And quantum merit essentially means payment for that which you have done, even though there may be some technical issue which would otherwise preclude you from claiming that amount. It's really an equitable remedy. It's not a directly a contractual remedy. Now, another issue is time. I mentioned earlier, time of the essence that we see in conveyancing contract. And um, the question might be, uh, essentially, has there been a breach of the contract to fail to perform on time? All right, so what is the, some of the key points relating to entire contracts are, party A must complete all their obligations before party B has any obligation at all. An entire contract, as we know, is not severable. It's not divisible. The de minimis rule says, we're not gonna be worried about trifles or insignificant issues. Um, and a contract, if, if construed severable, and some obligations are performed or not, the innocent party may seek a remedy for the obligations not performed. Now I mentioned tender before, remember when I was talking about the conveyancing clerks at the settlement location, calling for the other's name, what they were doing is going through a process of tender and a party must tender performance 
at the appropriate time, at the appropriate um, place, in the appropriate way. And what the party seeks to do is put them themselves in a, a situation where they can say, we did tender performance. We were at that time ready, willing and able to do so. It's an evidentiary thing. In the facts of a problem that you might get, it may be stated that this is the case. But remember, if you're trying to argue a case uh, to say that you were ready and they weren't, the question is, how do you prove that you are ready? And it's this process of tendering that is generally accepted as the practical way of doing so. And essentially, if a party is, for example, buying real estate and the seller's failing to perform, the tender process occurs when the party that's buying turns up at settlement with a check. And you take a photocopy or a picture or something of that check, um, which is then annexed to the affidavit material to say, we were ready, willing and able, we could perform, we had the money, here's the proof, here's the check. Um, sometimes issues arise in relation to vicarious performance. Now a promise a contract may provide that a third party can perform the agreement, but it may be that a contract may expressly or impliedly prohibit vicarious performance. Do we know what I mean by vicarious? That term you see quite often. Anyone know what it means, vicarious? Sometimes you hear of vicarious liability. No? It essentially means um, a situation where, yes, getting someone else to do the work in the uh, case or where an agent might be involved. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, Stephen. That's what we mean by vicarious. And we see that word in employment law, don't we? Where an allegation might be made that an employer is vicariously liable for the acts of the employee. Um, termination by agreement, a child party may choose to terminate by agreement and that termination may be under the terms of the contract. I mentioned earlier the case of Commonwealth and Amman Aviation. This is 1992, 174 CLR at 64. The Commonwealth terminated the contract, failed to do so in accordance with the methodology of the contract. This was an interesting case. The um, case involved Amman providing aerial surveillance to Australia's northern coastline. Amman claimed a thing called reliance damages, and that's distinct from expectation damages for the wasted expenditure equipping itself to perform the contract. The Commonwealth terminated the contract before paying any remuneration, reliance costs were uh, amounted to $6 million spent by Amman. The contract itself was $17 million, but the contract um, was not, uh, termination was not valid and the Commonwealth had to pay the $6 million to Amman. All right, um, we're getting pretty close to the end. I'll just keep going for a few more minutes. I know that people have a commitment to go to seven o'clock lectures at times. So thank you for staying with me just for a little longer. There is the issue of termination by contingency. And this is where the key issues of condition precedent or condition subsequent come into play. If a condition precedent does not occur, the contract is terminated. That's one way of looking at it. And that's why one way of distinguishing between it and a condition subsequent. A condition subsequent is such that if it does occur, the contract is terminated. You see the difference there? Now there's an example in your study guide. So let's imagine a very simple contract involving both the condition precedent and the condition subsequent. Nicole agrees to teach Mitchell to drive a motor vehicle. Mitchell agrees to pay Nicole $200 plus $20 per lesson. Obligations will only take effect if Mitchell obtains a learner's permit. The contract will be terminated if the learner's permit is suspended or withdrawn. 
Can you see the difference between the first sentence and the second sentence there? I know it's hard to keep moving and, and concentrating, but if the contract's terminated in accordance with the last of those, then Mitchell will pay $100 plus $20. So the third um, clause that I read out is a condition precedent. That is, the obligations only take effect if Mitchell obtains a learner's permit. Clause four is a condition subsequent. The obligations have commenced. Nicole, Nicole has begun to teach Mitchell, but the obligations cease if Mitchell loses his learner's permit. Have a look at that example. It's a good way of exemplifying the difference between conditions precedent and conditions subsequent. And we see the distinction often in a practical sense in real estate sale contracts. An example is Perry, P-E-R-R-I, against Cool and Gatter Investments, 1982, 149 CLR 537. If the buyer is unable to obtain finance, then the contract doesn't proceed. Geepel and Smith is another example. A shipping company contracted to transport coal by sea from England to Germany. After the contract was signed, but before the ship was departed, war broke out between France and Germany. France imposed a naval blockade upon Germany and the transport company didn't depart for Germany. The declaration of the naval blockade was deemed to be a condition subsequent, which had the effect of terminating the contract. Um, and I, I stand corrected. I do actually know that there, pr previously Christopher did talk about contracts for convenience. Um, I think the, the terminology that I would generally use is terminating at will. Um, but for convenience is, I accept now, I don't think Christopher's on the line anymore, a um, term that relates to that. So courts disagree on whether allowing termination at will or for convenience should be subject to an implied duty of care or duty of good faith. Um, all right, um, the other things that you might want to consider in the reading is termination by substitution or termination by accord or release. We've covered a lot of material tonight. Thank you all for staying with me with that. I hope that wasn't too overwhelming, but are there any questions, comments before I wrap up? And if uh, Chris is watching the rest, apologies for forgetting about uh, at will um, and um, for convenience, but I understand the question now. Any questions, comments, we're all good. All right, thank you all. We'll end tonight. We'll see you next week. All the best. Bye then.